John chapter 20, beginning in, or excuse me, John chapter 17, beginning in verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which I, you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before, before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for these words that the Apostle John recorded for our benefit. Lord, we pray that you would use them for your purposes this morning in our lives. You have such great plans for us. You have nothing but great thoughts towards us, Lord. We thank you for your loving Father's heart. Thank you for the process of being sanctified and set apart for your holy use, Lord. We pray that you would be our teacher this morning. Our hearts are open. Whatever you want to speak to us about, we're listening. And our desire is to not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word as well. So we commit it to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The title to the today's message is Jesus' Great High Priestly Prayer, Part 3. And today the Lord Jesus finishes up his great high priestly prayer. We have seen him pray for himself in verses 1 through 5. We've seen him pray for the disciples in verses 6 through 19, which you looked at last week. And then today we're going to finish up the chapter by looking at verses 20 through 26 and looking at how he prays for future believers, which is us. And we also have seen that he prayed audibly to maximize our joy, the, the original disciples' joy, and then our joy later as we get to read the Apostle John's words because he prayed out loud. We looked at verse 13 where Jesus said this. He said, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What a God we serve that wants us to have our joy maximized. He thinks of everything, and he's so good. He's so good. The more you know God, the more you love God, because you fall in love with who he is. And so he says this so that disciples both then and now would, could hear it and be blessed. And he said the reason is for this joy to be fulfilled because there's no greater encouragement that can come from hearing God the Son pray to God the Father and say all these uh, just amazing things um, about us and so things that are so endearing about us that it would mean a lot if we heard them say to directly to us. But to hear him pray these things to the Father and doing it out loud really is special. And he knew it would be special. And so he led the Apostle John to record these things, and he said them out loud so that he could do that, and we've just enjoyed it as we've gone through all these uh, beautiful verses. So these are the things I wanted to kind of itemize, the things that we have overheard already leading up to today. We've overheard him say, we are a gift from the Father to the Son. We've overheard him say, eternal life has been defined as knowing both the Father and the Son. We've seen him, and we've overheard him say, Jesus has finished his work on earth. Also, we've overheard Jesus talk about how he enjoyed pre-incarnate glory with the Father, something that we, would, we don't read anywhere else in this kind of detail. Also, we've overheard uh, all these things were given to Jesus, were given by the Father, and that also we are not of this world, and that also we've overheard Jesus pray that we would be protected from the evil one and set apart or sanctified by the Father's truth. And then he we heard, overheard Jesus say, thy word is truth. We saw that last week. So we have no higher thing to look to to be set apart 
for his special use than his word. There's no greater thing that we can study in this world than his word. No human potential, no self-help, no uh, all the other, these other things that unfortunately people will get up on a Sunday and share that are not his eternal word. Jesus said his words will outlive the heavens and the earth. He said, my words are spirit and they are life. So for us to have this time be set aside for that, knowing that God won't have his word return void in our lives is very special to us. And the more that you see that, the more you grow and the more you grow, the more you see that. It's just kind of uh, how it works. So in our text today, Jesus focuses attention on his future disciples. Look at verse 20. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. You didn't know you're in the Bible, did you? You're in the Bible. Now, before you start autographing verse 20 for people, you need to recognize that they're in the Bible too. That includes other believers as well. So hopefully it doesn't get your head too big. I'm pretty sure it won't. But we're in the Bible. He, he talks about those who will receive, uh, believe in me through their word, through the disciples' words, which were the fruit of that. It's been spread person to person, word of mouth, all the way since the disciples. And, and so he prays for us. But notice he doesn't say those who go to church or those who are religious. He says those who believe in me. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what constitutes the requirements for salvation. And uh, you have to be born again. We saw that in chapter 3. Jesus said that. You have to be, must be born again. And that's what believe in me means. Believe means to trust it doesn't merely mean mental assent or mental agreement. There are lots of people who mentally agree that Jesus died for the sins of mankind, even for their sins, or even rose from the dead. They believe that mentally, but that's not required. That's, that's not enough. They have to have a spiritual birth. There has to be repentance. There has to be trust. Belief that, that the Bible talks about is talking about trust. And so... Um, you know, people misunderstand. Well, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Like, okay, well, what does that mean to you? Ask people that. What does that mean to you to believe in Jesus? Find out. You know, and there's a difference between believing that and believing in. And I want to just kind of highlight the difference. Imagine you were up in the foothills or somewhere where there was a big, massive canyon and there was an old wooden you know, rickety footbridge that went over that cavern. And you see people go across it. You see people walk step by step and they're, you know, I don't know how people do that. I, it's hard for me. I don't have belief in, uh, I don't even have belief at or that in regarding that bridge, but people start going across it. You can believe in your head. Oh yeah, that'll hold me up. I'll go, I can go across that. And then someone says, okay, join me, come with me. No, I'm not going across you believe that, but you don't believe in. There's no trust there. And how you know that is because you're afraid because there's something to, to be lost if that bridge doesn't hold you up. So we can believe that salvation is for, that Jesus died for all mankind's sin. He rose from the dead. You can believe that. But that doesn't mean that you believe in. It doesn't mean you've placed your trust in that when there is something to lose if that's not true. And, and there definitely is something to lose if that's not true regarding salvation. And so that's the key. And he, so he says there, he says, for those who believe in me through their word, not merely just being religious, but actually somebody that's putting their trust in what Jesus did for them on the cross. We have to look to Jesus, what he did on that cross for us, and put our full faith in that to pay our way to heaven. Not that plus I'm going to go to church, plus I'm going to be religious, plus whatever it is we add to it, we cannot add to the cross. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. He didn't say, uh, I, did, I got you started, now pick it up from here 2,000 years later and do all this religious activity. It's a gift and we can't earn it. We have to just receive it. And so that's why the, there's no higher idea than what Jesus, how he was sent to die on the cross for our sins. You can't think of a way that God could be just and the justifier or the one that he quits all at the same time. 
But that's solved through the cross. So he begins to pray for us. And, and in verse 21, he begins to pray for unity. Look at verse 21. He says, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So if you're new to the Bible, you maybe see these us and the word us and the word we, and you think, are there three gods? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three gods? No, there's not three gods. There's one God who reveals himself in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so there's three planks to the Trinity in terms of three distinct beliefs that you have to believe to have, to have you be believing so that you will be believing the correct kind of biblical definition. So you have to believe in one God. Secondly, you have to believe that they're all three are called God. And then the third one is you have to believe that they're, all, that they're distinct. And, 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 that's, that's, and it's hard because we don't have anything in the natural that basically fully uh, compares to that. There's nothing that we can say it's like that. The closest you could come maybe might be, uh, you know, H2O can be liquid and gas and, you know, it could be ice as well. Uh, but ultimately, when you're talking about the infinite, there's really nothing finite that you can compare to the infinite. It's a whole complete different category. So he, so that's the first thing. And then also we need to understand the distinction between positional unity and practical unity. Positional unity is what God has already accomplished by making us into one body by the Holy Spirit. There's something called the universal church, meaning that the church is not a building, of course, and the people in the building are not necessarily believers, they can be, most of them are, but that just because you come in here doesn't mean that you're a born-again believer who's on their way to heaven. As the famous saying goes, just because you go into a garage doesn't mean you're a car. Or just because you go into Walmart doesn't mean you're in your pajamas. Just kidding. Um, if that's all you have, great. I've gone in my pajamas before. It hasn't been pretty. But you have to get that, that, the, the, the stuff for your kid in the middle of the night when they have a fever and you're just desperate. You got to go however you're, you're coming. So I'm glad that they accepted me just how I, I, I was. Um, but the point is, is that Jesus knows that there's, he knows our hearts. He knows who's legitimate, who's real. And, and so he wants us to understand that when we're born again, when we're, ba- when we're baptized into Christ, not water baptism, I'm talking about when you're born again and you're placed into the body of Christ, that actually means that you are united with a universal church all over the world. Every born again believer, uh, you are part of this spiritual organism that is the body of Christ, is the church. So we are, in reality, positionally, we are already one. We're already one. Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So he says, you are that. That is your designation. God has designated you one. He has brought you together and you are spiritually connected. He also wrote to the church of Ephesus in Ephesus or Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. I just want to pause there. And if you can look on the screen where it says keep, see, we don't, he doesn't tell us to, to cause this positional unity that we're in with other believers. He's saying it's already there. We need to keep it. We need to maintain it. And, 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 that, and he says, in the bond of peace there, he says, there, and there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So we were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit who spiritually connected us and united us in Christ. And, he, and the key is, it's the most important thing about this whole passage is, and Jesus is praying for unity. And in, and, in, and in one sense, we can answer Jesus' prayer by walking in this unity. The key is what Jesus is praying for here is for us to act like we are all, already in 
that unity or to live out practically what God has already accomplished positionally. So he's already connected us. He wants us to walk in that, to, to fulfill that by being a certain way when we're around other believers. Now, it takes maturity to overlook things. It takes maturity to, to be patient, to be gracious, to overlook things. It takes patience. It, it takes grace. It takes all these things that God has, has given us unlimited resources to have by the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, so a lot of times people think that the gifts of the Spirit are a measure of maturity, but it's really the fruit of the Spirit that's a measure, measure of maturity. How do I know that? Because the, the book of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians, especially the first book of Corinthians, you can't have more of a carnal or sinful church than the church of Corinth. They were in competition in everything, even their spiritual gifts, they're in competition. They were trying to be seen and trying to be, you know, uh, the equivalent of the disciples fighting over who's the greatest. And, but but Paul, the Apostle Paul w- was help, helpful to them in giving them instruction on how to be mature. And basically the whole, whole point, if you could sum it all up, was be other-centered. That's the key to maturity is to be other-centered, which requires us to be forgiving, to be gracious, to overlook things. And he prayed in verse 21, he says, that we would be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. That's, you can't get any more intimate than what he's describing here. He doesn't want any distance between us and him. He wants to be as close to us as possible. Those of us that know Christ have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. God's Spirit is inside of us. That doesn't mean as much to us as it did the Jewish mind. They had the Holy of Holies there that only the high priest could go into once a year. And that after he had his own sacrifice for his own sins and everything. We have the Holy of Holies living inside of us. Everywhere we go, we bring the kingdom of God. We bring the Holy Spirit with us. And he calls us to be influencers in his kingdom, to bring the the kingdom of God wherever we go and to be the leaders in that context, the spiritual leaders the head, not the tail, the ones that are being led by the spirit, the ones that are, that are hearing God's voice and being in control of the situation by the Holy Spirit, being able to yield to him and his plan and his words and his motives and his everything that comes forth out of our lives in that moment. He's called us to that. And there's that intimacy. And he's like, you guys understand this. Like, I want you to understand how intimate I want to be with you. To the extent that the Father is united in the Son and the Son and the Father, Jesus prayed we would be one in them both. God wants us so united that there's no daylight between us practically in relationship to one another. By His grace and by His power to live up to what He's already accomplished in uniting us spiritually in the sense of the body of Christ, He wants us to live up to that and function in the commensurate with what he's accomplished for us, completely on the same page, completely for the same things, completely united in our passion for what's important to God. Because as a Christian, my priorities need to be his priorities. What's important to him needs to be important to me. As we look at scripture, we see what those priorities are. That's why it's important for us to see all of scripture. I just love the fact that we're going through these verses on Thursdays and looking at all the the offerings and looking at the qualifications for the priests and all these things that it points to in terms of how Jesus fulfilled it all and how we're learning about the difference between ceremonial law, which we don't have to obey, and moral law that we do have to obey. And all these things that God is shaping us and, and, and changing us from the inside out as we study his word. We're aiming to be like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus, valuing everything that comes out of the Lord Jesus's mouth and just soaking it up and taking it, but not just merely for our benefit, for the benefit of those outside of our lives, outside of our own um, spheres of influence and, and, and to be an impact for people. God can take the smallest little amount of his word, his love, his mercy that we extend and use it. And he puts an exponent above it and it's used beyond what we could, beyond what we could possibly imagine. Paul wrote to the church of Rome and and Corinth. And he said, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, 
but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own eyes. So he said, be of the same mind toward one another. Then to the church of Corinth, he said, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's beautiful to see what God does, what he wants to do through us. There's very, and there's a very wise reason why he has us, wants us to be so united. And it's to bring him glory for one, of course, because we know that we're a lot, we're pretty different right now. I mean, just, just, we're just diverse and it's beautiful. And there's a lot of us probably wouldn't have much of a relationship with one another apart from the Lord, because we're just different. And we usually gravitate towards people that are like us because we're hopelessly self-centered. That's just how we are. So the fact that we have the Lord in common, that's why you can go across the world. I've been all over the world and you meet a believer and it's like, you're the same as people back home. You're so sweet. You're so amazing. You're, you know, it's what's the common denominator? It's the Lord. And when you look at Ephesians chapter four, it says one faith, we're going to read it in a minute, but one faith, one Lord, one, like we have so many things in common. We have way more in common than we have differences. So the very practical reason at the, is at the end of verse 21 though, look with me there. He says that the world may believe that you sent me. See, God always has his eye on others. He's always, and he wants our eyes to always be on others and get outside of ourselves. It's been said that unity has a testimony. And that testimony is Jesus has been sent as the Messiah. That's what it communicates. That the reality that Jesus has been sent is what people receive when they see us in unity with one another. When they see us love one another and they know there's there's got to be something to this Jesus thing, because these people are so different, but yet they're so united. There's got to be something to the fact that this Jesus is here and alive and he's been sent by God because there's no way these people would be in this kind of relationship and this kind of unity, showing this kind of love. Jesus said that all men may know that you're my disciples, but how you love one another. That's why he tells us so much to, to, to take that time to love one another. So I think it's easy to forget how powerful our love is. Let's just start with Sundays. You know, it's, it's the fact that we love each other the way we do and we express that is very powerful. And I think we can underestimate how powerful that is because we forget how bad the world is in terms of the lack of love. And we come in and people are um, just shocked um, how, how loving people can, can be. It completely disarms people and it draws them to God because mankind yearns for love, learns for relationship. God made us that way. We long to belong and, and to be loved. And so many people, so sad. They've, I've, I've seen people's comments online in different places where they, they've given up hope that that true love, that a real loving environment truly exists because they've been burned so many times by false promises and false hopes. And people are so self-consumed. They just devour people and they're just looking for some place that's real and authentic. I remember when I first became an assistant pastor in 2003 and my senior pastor, Damian Kyle, told us, he said, I want you on Sundays to really be looking for people who are by themselves. He goes, don't forget that sometimes people, it'll take them months or even years to get up the nerve to come into a place like this. And then if they come in and they don't see any love or experience any love, then their dashes are hoped. And they're like, well, I thought it would be different there, but it's not any different than out in the world. They can't, there's so much at stake for us to be looking for the person by themselves, looking for the person that is not fitting in, to, to, to look for those people. And, and, and God wants us to do that. He wants us to be really sensitive to that. So many of us here are very good. I remember when I first visited here, praying about coming here, and no one knew that, but I got mauled. I got mauled by Millie. I got mauled by Judy, you know, and I was like, wow, this is a pretty loving place. It's one of the most loving places I've been at in terms of a, of a church. And I think that as, as we grow, that's going to just get more and more evident there as, 
Because whoever is forgiven much, Jesus said, loves much. And we, we know we've been forgiven of a lot. I know I have. And I do need forgiveness all the time, just like you do. So he just wants us to focus on being in complete unity with other people. Now, that requires us to overlook things, like I said, and keeping the main thing the main thing. We may not, we, we may not believe exactly the same. That's okay. And, you know, of course, something substantive, something systemic, something you know, foundational, of course, the beliefs are matter, and doctrine matters and everything. But in terms of secondary issues and things, we should never divide over those things. And it actually is a testimony of of God's grace for people to dwell in unity with each other that, that believe diff- somewhat different things. Now, he says there that we've received glory to be in unity with one another. Look at verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. What is the glory that we've received? He's actually given us a specific glory so that we can be in unity with each other. That's how important it is to God. He's given us a glory that we would be enabled to love each other. And it's the Holy Spirit living inside of us, transforming us from glory to glory, as we're told. He works in us to bring us closer to one another. Anyone here remember Star Wars? I know Mike does. Mike loves Star Wars, and I'm right there with him. But I remember when I first watched Star Wars, and they had this thing called a tractor beam, where they actually pull ships in to close to them, and they would get stuck in tractor beams, or they would put their tractor beam out. I think that's probably more Star Trek. Some nerds will correct, correct me on that. But um, anyway, I'm one of them probably. But, um, and I just remember that's a pretty cool idea that you could just bring in a ship. You could just suck them in, you know, and... I just thought of that when I was looking at this, thinking about how the Holy Spirit brings people towards us, and He brings us toward other people. He's always trying to bring us together, and the enemy is always trying to divide us and bring us apart. Our sinful nature is always trying to divide from other people, because the easiest thing for us to do when we're irritated with someone or someone's doing something that bothers us is just to, is just to like, okay, I'm done with you. But God doesn't give us that option. You know, think about if we were the only church in Half Moon Bay or in this whole area, let's say, and, and he, we have a conflict with someone. We can't just go to another church. That was the case in this context here. In many places in the world today, they don't just have a church on every corner where you could just go to another church when you have this conflict, which means that God knows he's given us all the resources to reconcile with people and to, to forgive people and to have them forgive us. So it's amazing that he's given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us this glory to be able to be in unity with each other. I mean, if you don't really study this passage, it's hard to... There's other passages, of course, like I read, but you can forget the priority that it is for God that we're in unity with other believers. And I do want to make a quick distinction between unity and conformity. Conformity is what the cults do. They force same behavior. It's not a willing loving thing that happens because of the Holy Spirit inside people that's bringing people close to one another. It's them forcing man-made rules and forcing through fear them to do the same behavior. There's a difference. The Holy Spirit doesn't, uh, doesn't use manipulation. He doesn't use control tactics. He's just inviting all the time, inviting us to cooperate with him and, and convicting us and showing us when our heart's not right in that. So such a beautiful thing. Now, in verse 23, he says, I in them and you in me, that they may be one, per, or they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And he says perfect in one there. Do you see that? The middle of verse 23. It means to be completed or fulfilled in one. So actually, until we're in unity with other believers, we're not, we haven't been perfected or completed or fulfilled how God intends. We need to understand that from Jesus' words here. So we can't reach that. And he wants us to reach our full potential. And in part of how he makes disciples, so how are disciples made? We know that's the purpose of why the church gathers, is for disciples to be made. He does that through the leaders equipping the saints for the work of ministry. And then he does it also concurrently with every part doing its share, using whatever spiritual gift or gifts they have to build up other believers. Both of those things have to be happening 
for disciples to be made. No church does that perfectly in the world. Every, every church is growing in, in those things, including our church here. So he, we have to understand that he wants us to, to be fulfilled and be made perfect in one that the world may know that you have sent me. So there's implications related to unbelievers coming to Christ if we're not in unity with other believers, because that in part is how he wants to draw them in, if that makes sense. So there's so many isolated Christians, unfortunately, that, that don't cooperate with the, what the Holy Spirit wants to do in this. And we're also told in verse 23, the world will know two things if we walk in unity. The first thing is the Father sent Jesus. And then secondly, we have been loved by the Father as it has, as he has loved Jesus. That's what they will know. By the Holy Spirit, he will show them that, these things. And so that's what's at stake regarding us walking in this unity that he's talking about. It's so powerful. We need to have that kind of unity. You know, and you have to start with your own, your own family, you know, your own uh, church, local church. And so we need to be in unity. We need to be of the same mind, the same heart. You know, when someone starts serving, they usually get a doctrinal questionnaire, making sure that they're on the same page. We're in doctrinal unity. Then there needs to be a unity related to their, the philosophy of ministry. And there's so many things about our philosophy of ministry that um, are refreshing for people that, are, that have been in, in, in places that have been, you know, not healthy environments. You know, like the leaders are, our philosophy of ministry, the leaders are here to serve the people, not the other way around. Now, that may seem like so obvious, but there are if you've ever been in some other churches where that's not the case, you kind of feel like people are, the leaders are like CEOs and people are there to just kind of, you know, serve what the church needs. Like, we're not going to ever have you feel like if, if you know, you are here exists to bless the church. You, you, you are here to bless the church in the sense of how God sees it. But decision making in terms of how where you serve or don't serve has to do with if you're led by the Spirit. And our philosophy of ministry is you can hear the Holy Spirit just as well as we can. So we depend upon you hearing the Holy Spirit. We want you to be where God's called you to be. And we don't say, okay, this is our idea of what church is supposed to be like. We need all these people to fill these roles. No, it's more of what's your calling? What has God called you to do? And then we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to shape who, what the church is based on who he's provided and what gifts you have. That changes everything in terms of if the Spirit's going to be dependent upon and if the Holy Spirit's going to be the one that's holding everything together. The leaders can't hold the church together, can't provide the motivation, can't do all these things. And unfortunately, when you take a business model and you put it into a church environment, you're, you're doing everything like the world does, but that's not how God's called the church to be. That God's called the church to be a living organism, and he doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. So whatever you're called to, he's going to give you everything that you need. And if every part of the whole is spirit-directed, spirit-empowered, and gifted, then the whole will be uh, all those things as well. And that's why we often pray that there'd be no explanation apart from the Holy Spirit with what happens here. If man can figure it out, it's probably not of God. God specializes in doing what we can't even comprehend. So we need all of that. Now he says in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. So Jesus only expresses desire one other place in the Bible. Uh, when he talks about, I long to eat this Passover with you again in the kingdom, that's the other time, and this is in this here. All the rest of the time, it's I always do those things which please the Father, and I speak the things that the, I hear the Father speak. It was always the Father's will as a model for us. But here he says, I desire... Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. He wants us to be with him. And he said this in John chapter 14, where I am there, you'll be also. I'm going to go prepare a place for you, but also that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. So we'll see him in his glory. The apostle John himself, we see in Revelation, sees Jesus in his glory and he falls down as though he was dead. This is the man who laid his head back on the breast of Jesus as they reclined at meals, being that intimate with him, 
but he is so blown away by the resurrected, glorified Christ in that context that he falls down as, as, as dead. There's a glory about Jesus we haven't even discovered yet by far. And he, and he goes, I desire for them to experience that. That's his heart for us. That's his heart for that we would see him in that glory. It's so beautiful. And then he closes out in verses 25 and 26. Oh, righteous father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So it says, I have declared to them your name. We've gone over this multiple times. Your name means your character, your nature, that which is corresponding to your word, your, who you are. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he says that, and then he says, and I will, I've declared it, and I will declare it. And that's a tense where it's talking about continuous action. He's declaring uh, his, his, the Father's character to them. He, he's done that. He's going to continue to do that as he reveals the Father. And then he says, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. So he, he's expressed that he wants that love in us. And he's given us that love. The Holy Spirit produces that love. Paul would later write, the love of Christ constrains me or compels me. The love of Christ. The closer we get to Jesus, we don't have to pray for God to give us more love for people. All we have to do is to get closer to Jesus, to spend time with Jesus. And then his character starts flowing out of us and through us. And the fruit of the Spirit comes forth. And it's a beautiful thing. I love seeing a life that was one way. And then after they come to know Christ, how that life starts beginning to change from the inside out. And it's a beautiful life. The yielded, surrendered life, surrendered life is the most beautiful life you can see. And if you take the best that comes forth through all of us by the Holy Spirit, you've, you've understood who Christ is because that's who comes forth is his nature and his, his character and all those things. So we have to ask the question, what contributes to disunity? Because if unity uh, has a testimony, then disunity must provide a testimony as well. So what gets in the way? Our overly focusing on our differences. I've said this many times, but so often churches, the, the name of a church is distinguishing their differences uh, there. But just locally though, our difference is to focus on those things. We need to see the diversity in the body of Christ as a thing of beauty, as a thing of God's creativity, his work of art. We are, Ephesians 2.10 says that we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared in advance that we should walk in them. So we shouldn't look at our differences and, and have that some, be something that we allow to our, our lives to repel from, but we need to appreciate those things. Also, not seeing how important unity is to God. This is the first step, looking at what Jesus prayed for. And he's praying for this unity, and it's a priority for God for us to be in unity with other people. Also, not being gracious and forgiving. Oh, that's for another church. That's not for here. We don't ever struggle with that. But we have to be gracious and forgiving. And I love the excuse that can come up in my heart and other people's hearts. They don't deserve it mean to be gracious. That's what gracious means. It means you give grace when they don't deserve it. It's unmerited favor. They don't deserve it. When do we ask people to give us grace only when we deserve it? We, we don't do that. We want all the grace we can get. Bring it. Come on. Give me more grace. I want more grace. We're addicted to grace being extended by other people. Why wouldn't we want to be doing the same thing? And I know it's difficult at times, but that's where we don't rely on our own strength. That's where we go to God and say, God, this person annoys me. This person's driving me crazy. This person rubs me the wrong way. However we want to say it. And just, we can be honest with God. He knows our hearts anyway. God, help me. Help me to be appropriate towards them. Help me to be how you are towards them. Help me to see them as you see them. That really helps a lot. Sometimes people have come to me and said, you know, help me with, I have this conflict with this person. Help me. And I ask them, how often do you pray for them? I don't, I, yeah, 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 I, yeah, that's a good point, pastor, you know, and, and I'm like, start praying for them and watch what happens. Start praying for them because you'll get, start getting God's heart for them. And, and that's makes it so much easier. So, and also not giving people the benefit of the doubt, 
You know, we can give some people the benefit of the doubt, other people, you know, not so much. Don't assume the worst. Don't assume the worst with people. Assume the best. Love hopes all things. So it's important for us to give people the benefit of the doubt. Also, not remembering how much God forgave us. Oy vey. That's a big one right there. Jesus talked about this whole, gave these parables of, of these people that were forgiven so much, and then they, weren't, they didn't forgive others that were such a smaller amount. God has a very low tolerance for unforgiveness in his people because of how much we've been forgiven. So we can't hold that against other people. Also not caring about unbelievers and their salvation. Jesus said the reason why he wants us to do this in part is because it will it'll affect unbelievers' lives. They'll actually see that Jesus was sent by God. Do we care about unbelievers coming to Christ? That's part of communing with him and spending time with him and reading his word and seeing what his priorities are and have them start to become our priorities. And his biggest priority is that the world would be saved. That we can't grow as a Christian and be mature if we don't care about the lost. Let me just say that again. You can't be mature and like be like God if you don't care about the lost. God wants us to care about the lost. So finish chapter 17. What a beautiful picture of God's heart. We, get, we got to be like we were there to be able to listen to what John the Apostle recorded by the Holy Spirit, be able to hear God the Son say these things to God the Father, which means so much to us. And he said it as, again, the, uh, as a motivation. He said he did all this so that our joy would be to the full in, in ourselves. What a beautiful prayer. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for all these verses. Lord, would you please help us to walk in unity? Lord, by your Holy Spirit with other believers, even if they're different, even if they rub us the wrong way, even if they're not appropriate with us, help us, Lord, to by your strength and by your power and by your grace to be appropriate with them and to forgive and to be gracious and to love unconditionally, Lord. We know it blesses your heart. We know it blesses our kids when they get along. We, want you, and we know that you want us to get along and to love each other. We want to be, you to receive glory from that love that we extend to other people. Thank you for the love that's here, Lord, in this family. Thank you for, we get to see it all the time, the love that's for, that we have for one another. Would you, we pray that you'd bring in many more people that can experience that love among us as you add to your church. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.